Okay, um, well, welcome uh, everybody to, to the first real live speaker that the Center for Legal Theory has had in almost three years now. Uh, it's very exciting to see uh, Doug Huzak, who's one of the leading criminal theorists in the world and um, uh, Meritus Professor uh, at uh, Rutgers University's Philosophy Department, which is, of course, one of the top philosophy departments um, in the United States and, and indeed the world. Uh, so Doug is, uh, well, just amazing to see you here uh, in person. And uh, he's going to talk about the price of criminal skepticism. And I think that's probably all I really need to say. Take it away. Well, it really is a pleasure to be here, finally. And I want to thank the university and especially Andrew, who has done more over the last few weeks to take care of me than he has uh, done with his own work, I'm sure. And so I'm really appreciative. And it's a great pleasure to make my first trip to Singapore. I'm really impressed with this place. So I don't like speakers to talk too much about themselves, but I want to say a bit about the motivation for what you're about to hear. For much of my now long career, I've aspired to defend a retributive penal philosophy and to explain why it is not nearly as punitive as its reputation. So to this end, I've argued first that the number and scope of offenses should be narrowed. We've got too many crimes and drug offenses in particular are among those that I have argued we should eliminate. And secondly, our defenses are too narrow. In particular, the defense of ignorance of law is something that I think should be expanded. So as a result of these views, I have long favored what I call a minimalist theory of criminal law and punishment against those who would use the criminal sanction more frequently and with more severity. So I was always the guy in the room who favored less punishment. But in the last couple of years, all this has changed. My old minimalist approach now has come to seem almost antiquated. There has been an enormous change in the writings of criminal theorists in the United States. In the wake of the murder of George Floyd, a lot of progressive academics don't join me in concluding that we should punish less, but contend that we should not punish at all. Punishment and criminal law abolitionism have always been around, but were something of a fringe position in philosophical circles. And now, it's become much more mainstream. So relative to my peers, especially my younger peers, if they're peers, or the younger people in the profession, I've suddenly become the philosopher who wants to punish more often and with greater severity. So this shift has had a real profound effect on me and my understanding of where I fit into the profession. So I have come to feel like a dinosaur. And this is part of what motivates my presentation today. There's nothing like allegations of racial injustice to galvanize progressives. Now, incidentally, racial disparities in enforcement are the single most important factor that has finally stimulated drug reform in much of the United States. After several years of making principled arguments for why we should not punish drug offenders, the widespread dissemination of data about the racial disparities in drug law enforcement has achieved what a lifetime of philosophical efforts had failed to bring about. So I want to make a, another preliminary point before I get to my paper. So I obviously come from a country in which crime rates are very high and punishment is commonplace and severe. Some of the academic trends that motivate my presentation, I'm sure, are much less pronounced here in Singapore, where crime rates are so much lower. I wonder how real and perceived crime rates correlate with the popularity of radical ideas about penal justice. I sometimes suspect that abolitionist and skeptical ideas enjoy less appeal in a place that needs to resort to punishment much less frequently. 
there's less injustice to eradicate. On the other hand, as rates of many violent crimes have rapidly escalated throughout much of the United States, calls to become more punitive are being expressed much more often. Like just about everything else in the United States these days, the commentary on this issue reflects extreme political polarization and the point of view of progressive theorists and the public have come to be on very different sides of this debate. debate. So despite being a philosopher, I am not allergic to facts and I try to stay abreast of this development. And so I guess now I will get to the paper I circulated and some of you have looked at it and some of you haven't. There's a growing trend in philosophical commentary about penal justice that I call criminal law skepticism. And I use this very vague term broadly to encompass any movement to constrain criminal justice institutions so radically that they barely resemble those with which we are familiar. At its most extreme, it includes criminal law abolitionism. So whatever its name, I intended to cover all of the scholarship that does not simply urge caution or a minimalist, more judicious use of the criminal law to address social problems. Instead, its thrust is much more sweeping. It presents reasons to doubt that the criminal law as presently constituted should continue to exist at all. I make no effort to categorize the several varieties of skepticism. Their forms and underlying rationales are diverse and, and frequently humane. Abolition skeptics, abolitionists and skeptics divide on what they believe should replace the criminal law in its present form. For this reason, no single argument can refute all versions of skepticism. Instead, I respond by describing the price that might be incurred if skeptics were to achieve their objective. I list 10 valuable functions served by the criminal law as it currently exists, several of which are too seldom appreciated in philosophical commentary. No case for criminal law skepticism is complete unless efforts are made to explain how alternatives to the criminal law can achieve these functions or afford to dispense with them. Each of the 10 valuable functions I will mention contributes to some degree or another to a justification of the criminal law as long as a justification is construed to refer to the reasons that show an institution to be worth preserving even in the face of countervailing considerations. So my strategy is pluralistic, which I take to be a departure from orthodoxy among penal theorists. For very mysterious reasons, the pluralism that is so pervasive elsewhere in normative ethics is conspicuously absent when we turn to philosophical commentary about the justification of criminal law and punishment. Now, Andrew here is quite an exception to this trend. Many theorists persist in assigning a single function to criminal law and punishment to give offenders what they deserve or to reduce crime, for example. I think it's simplistic to allow the fate of the criminal law to stand or fall depending on how well it achieves one objective. So I try to correct this unfortunate tendency by collecting 10 of the diverse and important features of criminal justice that would be difficult or impossible to replicate if the criminal law, as we know it, were abolished or radically transformed. Some of these functions have been discussed extensively, whereas others have received relatively little attention from legal philosophers. So my account is necessarily superficial. I make no effort to prioritize these functions in order of importance or to resolve the likely conflicts among them. Nor is the number 10 magical. Readers are uh, welcome to add to this list or to subtract from it, as long as you don't subtract from it too much. So as I've said, philosophers have several different grounds for accepting some version of criminal law skepticism. And I sympathize with many of these motivations. There's much about the criminal law about which we should be 
critical. And so here is a very brief sketch of some of their animating concerns, most of which I share. So our institutions of penal justice are astronomically expensive, and the opportunity cost of this ma massive outlay leads some commentators to conclude that the criminal law should be replaced. Crime can be prevented more efficiently and humanely by addressing its root socioeconomic causes. In addition, the penal law empowers officials with tools of repression, which they inevitably wield most frequently against the disadvantaged, often against racial minorities. It is used as a subterfuge to per perpetuate class dominance. Arguably, it lacks standing to judge persons whose criminal behavior is due to socioeconomic deprivations that states should do more to rectify. Moreover, it too often mistakenly punishes individuals who are innocent. We simply cannot make correct judgments with enough certainty to retain confidence in criminal justice institutions. In addition, it's hard to see how law itself could possess the moral authority to coerce conformity, conformity with its directives, especially when one attends to the details of how legislation is actually enacted. Finally, it inflicts major hardships on offenders for reasons many philosophers find normatively indispensable. It seemingly treats offenders as a mere means to a greater good, for example. So each of these allegations should be familiar to criminal law theorists. Many have been the topic of entire monographs, and several of those philosophers who are sensitive to these difficulties are not content merely to improve our systems of criminal justice, but aspire to radically transform them or even to get rid of them altogether. Although I don't believe that the arguments of these criminal law skeptics ultimately succeed, I admit that we should applaud the underlying motivations of many of the philosophers who advance them. A large dose of skepticism about the criminal law is healthy. So a preliminary challenge awaits anyone who purports to evaluate criminal law abolitionism. And this problem involves uncertainty about the very nature of the criminal law. If we start with very different conceptions of what the penal law is, we would expect to differ about whether or why it should be preserved. Quite a few versions of criminal law skepticism are rooted in disagreement about the nature of the penal law, and it would be helpful to contrast those that are from those that are not. So I'll begin by simply stating, rather than by defending the view I favor, I presuppose that the criminal law is best understood as that body of law that subjects those who breach its directive to state punishment. And punishment, as I construe it, is an intentionally imposed deprivation that expresses condemnation. If a legislator enacts what he calls a crime, but proceeds to deny that anyone who commits it should ever be punished, I doubt that we would find his proposal to be intelligible. So this account facilitates an understanding of the issue I propose to address. What are the important functions of a domain of law that renders those who engage in given kinds of conduct eligible for a state response that intentionally inflicts hard treatment and condemnation? What might be lost if we fail to maintain penal justice institutions as so construed. So I hope I don't need to belabor to support my claim that the phenomenon of criminal law skepticism is genuine, in the United States at least, before I turn to the price I believe its adherents are likely to pay if their pleas are heeded. Clear examples in my country are plentiful, so I'm going to take this trend for granted. Although I believe we are warranted in retaining the criminal law in roughly its present form, no one argument will demonstrate that we are correct to do so. In what follows, therefore, I will depart from more typical philosophical methodology by making no serious effort to respond to the many arguments marshaled in favor of skepticism about the criminal law, and instead, the main point of my paper is to describe the price we would be likely to pay if we become too skeptical. 
The ten important functions I contend are served by the criminal law are at best, or at best would be jeopardized, and at worst would be sacrificed altogether if the criminal justice system were radically transformed. I doubt that most of those legal philosophers who are skeptics about the criminal law fully appreciate what they are in danger of losing. I'm sure some are prepared to give up several of the functions of the criminal law I recount, whereas others would be led to devise an ingenious way to try to retain them. But the loss of any of the 10 functions I describe would represent a substantial price I believe we should be very reluctant to pay. So here then is the fundamental challenge I believe that skeptics must respond to. For any given function, the skeptic has only three options, I think. He must A, show that the function is not achieved by the criminal law as it exists or is not really very important. B, show that his replacement for the criminal law can preserve that function as well or better than the status quo or C, argue that the advantages of skepticism are sufficiently great that they outweigh whatever value one or more of these functions has. It's not enough simply to be a critic. That's easy. But unless my challenge is confronted, I don't believe we should take skepticism very seriously. So here are now 10 functions. Uh, number one is crime reduction. And on just about any account, an important function of the criminal law and punishment is to reduce the incidence of criminal conduct understood as behavior which the state has authoritatively pronounced ought not to be done. The criminal law itself succeeds in such reduction primarily through incapacitation, specific deterrence, and general deterrence. This is surely the best candidate for the single justificatory function of the criminal law, although, of course, I emphatically deny that it should be thought to have a single justification. Still, this function is so important that it lends, that it tends to preoccupy the attention of both criminal law skeptics as well as their opponents. Those who deny that criminal law and punishment do reduce crime often move directly from this allegation to abolitionism. In turn, a few of their critics are quick to concede that if these skeptics were correct in their conviction, that is, if it really were true that criminal law and punishment did not reduce crime, they then would join their adversaries and embrace skepticism as well. As a result, discussions of crime reduction, reduction have come to dominate debates between criminal law skeptics and their opponents. For my part, I believe that the evidence supports that the conclusion that criminal law and punishment do often reduce crime through each of the foregoing mechanisms, that is through incapacitation, specific deterrence, and general deterrence. For three reasons, though, I make no attempt to defend this conclusion. First, the controversy about crime reduction is almost entirely empirical and thus lies beyond the expertise of most legal philosophers. Second, since the debate has been waged so extensively elsewhere, I have nothing really original to contribute to it. Finally, and most importantly for present purposes, the case against a given form of skepticism should not be thought to depend solely on this controversy. So in what follows, I describe nine additional functions I believe are performed by criminal law and punishment. In light of the attention focused on crime reduction, Many of these functions, and the last eight in particular, tend to be overlooked. Skeptics must show not only how their alternative is able to reduce crime, but also should be pressed to explain how many or all of these subsequent functions can be served as well. Unless, of course, they're prepared to argue that our society can afford to dispense with them. So second, expressive functions. Both friends and foes of criminal law skepticism tend to acknowledge that the criminal law as presently constituted serves expressive functions. Convicted defendants are not merely held liable, they are pronounced guilty. This judgment publicly condemns. It communicates a message other legal judgments lack. It authoritatively labels the defendant as a criminal with all of the resonance and social meaning that this term conveys. 
A week doesn't pass without invoking expressivist concerns in favor of a new criminal law or a novel application of an existing law. Literally hundreds of examples could be produced. Calls to repeal or to relax the enforcement of an existing criminal law are often met with the rejoinder that any such change would send the wrong message. This retort is perhaps the most familiar basis on which calls to decriminalize the use of a given drug are still resisted. Again, examples of this phenomenon could be multiplied. So how might criminal law skeptics preserve this expressive function? At the present time, alternative means to effectively indicate that the state regards a given kind of conduct as serious and worthy of condemnation are not readily available. Unless criminal law skeptics are willing to risk losing the ability to communicate the message that given kinds of conduct are taken seriously and deserving of condemnation by a polity, states may have little choice but to retain the criminal law in something close to its present form. So now I want to turn to eight functions that are discussed, discussed less often by criminal law skeptics. The third is the unavailability of insurance to reimburse defendants for damages. The criminal law is crucial in determining which losses are covered by insurance when defendants are made to pay for the harms they cause. If the criminal law were abolished or radically altered, the implications for insurance markets would potentially be cataclysmic. It's hard to see how this important function could survive a fundamental dismantling of criminal justice institutions. So all commentators appreciate the importance of compensating innocent victims for the losses caused by defendants who are at fault. Obviously, few culpable wrongdoers have the resources to make victims whole without some device to spread losses over persons as well as over time. In the United States, elsewhere, insurance is the mechanism for distributing these losses and thus for ensuring that victims are compensated. But some losses are not and presumably should not be spread throughout the defendant's insurance pool. Foremost among these are the losses caused by criminal activity. Liability insurers have long excluded coverage for tort claims caused by criminal activity. Insurance contracts typically contain clauses that deny reimbursement for harms arising out of intentional injuries by the insured. Many such contracts include additional clauses that specifically state that the insurer will not pay for tort claims due to criminal acts, even when the resulting injuries were unintentional. These clauses eliminate coverage for the foreseeable injuries caused by any criminal act, as well as for injuries related to specific crimes such as molestation or abuse. Many liability insurance contracts also contain provisions that exclude coverage for punitive damages, and some courts allow insurance companies to refuse to pay for punitive damage, damages even in the absence of explicit language. Many of those legal philosophers who endorse criminal law skepticism aspire to eliminate incarceration. Much about this aspiration should be applauded. Monetary fines are and ought to be a preferable sanction when defendants have the means to pay. This alternative is especially attractive when day fines are calibrated to the wealth or income of defendants. But it is unthinkable, it is literally something that would never occur to defendants to suppose that they could simply pass the costs of their fines onto their insurance companies. But if the criminal law is radically transformed and a defendant incurs a monetary penalty for what is presently criminal behavior, on what basis could his insurance company deny him reimbursement? Perhaps skeptics foresee that fines too should wither away along with incarceration, but how then are states to ensure compliance with rules presently denominated as criminal? The rationales for the foregoing exclusions from insurance contracts are especially significant for present purposes. Textbooks typically offer economic explanations. 
The state has an interest in decreasing crime and moral hazard ensues whenever defendants are not made to pay the full cost of their harmful activities. But this explanation is incomplete at least. All liability insurance creates the potential for moral hazard. Drivers, I suspect, are more likely to be negligent, for example, when their insurance companies will pay for the harms they inflict. So why then is insurance for criminal activity any different? Unless there is something special about the criminal law that makes the problem of moral hazard more worrisome, the economic rationale for crime exclusion clauses in insurance contracts is inexplicable. To be sure, many criminal law skeptics deny that anything is distinctive about the criminal law. In reality, however, these insurance exclusions reflect normative concerns about the propriety of insulating people from the consequences of their criminal behavior. Indeed, when enforcing these exclusions, courts commonly refer in moralistic terms to the public policy concerns that would be raised if crime insurance were available. Thus, liability insurance separates crime from tort, not merely because of moral hazard, but also because of normative objections to lumping criminals along with tortfeasors in the liability insurance pool. Again, these objections presuppose that something is special about the criminal law that differentiates it from tort. Thus, the principles governing insurance are instrumental in drawing the boundary between tort and crime. Criminal law skeptics face an uphill struggle in explaining the insurance implications if this boundary were redrawn or obliterated. In the absence of a criminal justice system, insurance policies might conceivably cover defendants for all of the losses they cause or the fines they incur, whether or not they are presently denominated as criminal. I mean, this would be a terrible idea, and it's hard to imagine any legal philosopher who would openly embrace it. Alternatively, Insurance policies could explicitly identify specific kinds of conduct they would not cover. Without calling it a crime, a policy could deny coverage for harassment or molestation, for example. But this alternative simply reintroduces the criminal category without using the label. Perhaps a third option could be devised, although my powers of imagination are not up to the task. I conclude that criminal law skepticism should be resisted without some innovative solution to how it would preserve the normative rationales that presently govern insurance markets. Incidentally, I've interacted with any number of people I call criminal law skeptics, and I am not aware of anyone who addresses this particular issue, although I am always eager to be informed otherwise. So the fourth function that I identify is called suppression of non-legal violence and vigilantism. A well-functioning state protects its citizens from wrongful harm. In its efforts to achieve this objective, it confers on the state a near monopoly on the use of violence, thus suppressing the tendency to resort to self-help that bypasses official legal channels. How important is this function? More specifically, how much, legal, how much extra legal violence should we anticipate if a mode of criminal law skepticism is implemented and the penal law as we know it is radically transformed? Obviously, no one should profess too much confidence in her answer to this question. Among other things, we don't know how much violence our legal system suppresses at the present time. So how might we move beyond mere conjecture? We might try to determine how much self-help in developed countries is explained by perceptions that its system of criminal justice fails to discharge its duty of protecting citizens. This possibility might enable us to make rough headway in identifying the extent to which the criminal justice system suppresses tendencies toward vigilante actions. So what happens in developed countries when persons believe their criminal justice system is unable or unwilling to protect them? Many such persons do not remain passive, but take extra legal measures to protect themselves. 
So I'll describe as vigilantes those persons who regard their extra legal actions as justified. And in academic circles, vigilantes have a bad reputation, conjuring up images of murders by opponents of abortion, uh, of physicians, as well as lynching of minorities by white-robed racists. A more nuanced picture emerges in cases in which the predicament of the vigilante evokes sympathy. If the state fails to protect women from repeated instances of domestic violence, for example, how should we re recommend victims to behave? A body of respectable scholarship regards preventive harm by battered women as non-culpable and justified rather than as merely excused. According to this rationale, the use of even deadly force against their aggressors is classified as permissible instead of simply undeserving of punishment. But prospective victims of domestic violence are not the only group to evoke sympathy for employing extra-legal self-help. Recent history offers numerous examples of groups that have resorted to vigilanteism rather than suffer victimization. In a recent book, Paul and Sarah Robinson describe several instances of vigilanteism in United States history. For present purposes, I construe their monograph to have three central themes. First, persons resort to vigilanteism when they perceive that the criminal justice system is failing to protect them. When ordinary persons doubt the state's commitment to preventing wrongful harm, they become more likely to take matters into their own hands. Caterus paribus, one would expect that the more effective a system is, or is perceived to be, in preventing violence, the lower the probability that citizens will take extra legal means to secure these ends. Second, legal officials, police, prosecutors, and judges are often complicit in these vigilante efforts. Police are more likely to test a lie when they are confident arrestees are guilty but are unable to provide reliable evidence of their belief because of legal technicalities. They pretend to have issued Miranda warnings or to have observed the legal requirements governing search and seizure, for example, even though they know they have not done so. Prosecutors, in turn, add charges they would not otherwise have brought against defendants who they believe have escaped their just deserts in prior legal encounters. Robinson and Robinson provide ample reason to conclude that complicity in a legal action on the part of legal officials, which they describe as shadow vigilanteism, is prevalent and can be more damaging to the legal fabric than classic vigilanteism. Third, the public often, though of course not always, applauds the action of vigilantes. Even though the criminal justice system in the United States instills more confidence than that of many countries, only 29% of respondents in a Gallup poll expressed a great deal or quite a bit of confidence in our criminal justice system. Uh, the success of a host of blockbuster movies involving Dirty Harry, Charles Bronson, and a rash of comparable characters shows that huge swaths of the public approve of vigilantes when the criminal justice system is thought to have failed its citizens. In this genre, I include the enduring popularity of superheroes like Batman and Spider-Man, whose daily routines are devoted to catching villains who elude the bumbling and incompetent efforts of ordinary police. Even though careful thought may reveal that the moral record of vigilantes in the United States is more balanced than many academics tend to believe, my present point is not to defend an all things considered judgment about the general phenomenon. Instead, my main contention is that it is preferable to minimize the incentives for these legal, for these extra legal remedies in the first place. Vigilanteism would almost certainly wane if the criminal justice system were perceived to be more effective in preventing crime. Thus a, penal, uh, syst uh, thus a penal system can expect to reduce vigilanteism by earning credibility with the public. I fear, however, that the implementation of various strains of criminal law skepticism 
would exacerbate existing tendencies to resort to legal, extra legal measures to prevent wrongful harm. Again, no one can be certain of these effects in the absence of details about the harm prevention plans of those who would fundamentally revise our penal justice system. But skeptics must at least worry about how drastic reforms might increase resort to self-help, which the criminal law in its present form seems reasonably effective in curbing. Fifth, the powers of legal officials. The existence of a criminal enactment gives special powers to legal officials in addition to the power to punish. Most significantly, police have the power to arrest and prosecutors have the power to charge when wrongdoing is denominated as criminal. If the line between the penal and the non-penal law were blurred or obliterated altogether, what would become of these powers? Would police and prosecutors no longer exist? Or would police be permitted to arrest persons who they reasonably suspect to have breached a contract? Would prosecutors be able to charge persons who they believe to have committed a tort? If the more radical criminal law skeptics succeed, it's hard to see why the state would have a need for legal officials whose primary responsibility is to arrest and prosecute, since at present, these powers are exercised against those who are thought to have committed a crime rather than some other kind of wrong. But before criminal law skeptics consign these officials to the ranks of the unemployed, we should keep in mind that police can be effective in preventing culpable wrongdoing before it occurs, even without utilizing their power to arrest. Whatever its deficiencies, the widespread use of stop, question, and frisk is credited by many for helping to achieve the remarkable decrease in violence throughout much of the United States from 1993 through 2019, especially in New York City. Raymond Kelly, the NYPD chief throughout much of the crime drop, claims that, quote, in conjunction with a variety of other methods and strategies, stop, question, and frisk has helped to drive crime down in New York City and to make the streets safer for everyone, unquote. Although the use of stop, question, and uh, frisk became much less popular, and more infrequent since the election of Mayor Bill de Blasio and the subsequent murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, New York City continues to stop and question dozens of suspects, really hundreds of suspects each day. In light of its probable crime preventive effects, few commentators call for the total abolition of the practice of stop, question, and frisk. Criminal law abolitionists should explain how their proposals would impact these powers of legal officials or whether they're prepared to eliminate the powers of these legal officials altogether. Careful thought about the role these officials play creates additional reservations about some versions of criminal law skepticism. The issue is not simply whether and under what condition states should have the ex post power to punish. States also need to decide whether they should have the authority to ensure compliance with norms ex ante through the direct use of coercive force. A special category of crime demarcates the kinds of wrongs for which this power is reserved. When you're selling loose cigarettes, the police may take them from your hand. When you're making a bomb, the police may escort you from your laboratory. When you're absconding with stolen goods, the police may stop you and seize them. With respect to non-penal norms, however, ex ante and ex post powers typically diverge, except perhaps in extraordinary circumstances. No one presupposes that states use their coercive powers to prevent torts or breaches of contract before they occur. With crimes, however, the situation is different. Criminal law skeptics should be pressed to explain how existing official powers to ensure compliance with norms would be affected if their proposals were implemented. Six, costs and accuracy of adjudication. Consider also the fate of persons alleged to have committed an illegal act. 
When a felony is, is charged against a defendant of moderate means, the costs of his defense are incurred by the public defender dispersed throughout the citizenry via taxation. Although nearly all commentators agree that public defenders are grossly underfunded and overworked in the United States, the prospect of abolishing their offices altogether could only make matters worse. At least some gains in justice are achieved by ensuring that persons accused of a serious crime are afforded a defense. The costs of adjudicating non-criminal wrongdoing, by contrast, are typically borne by private individuals. When a defendant is sued for breach of contract or a tort, for example, almost no one proposes that he be provided a defense at public expense. And when a plaintiff sues for personal injury, she usually pays for her own representation through a contingency fee. Thus, the existing distinction between the criminal and civil law helps to establish the boundary at which the state invests resources to ensure that injustice is avoided and innocent persons are not held liable. How would criminal law skeptics decide which public services to fund when laws are breached? If their, theories, if their theories were implemented, would accused wrongdoers be expected to incur the expense of clearing their names? Or would public resources be expended to resolve legal disputes that presently are treated as non-criminal? On a related point, consider the impact of some modes of criminal law skepticism on the goal of ensuring some degree of accuracy in legal adjudication. Without a publicly funded defense, one would expect that rates of false positives would increase and more persons would be subjected to penal sanctions despite their innocence. In what is currently conceptualized as the criminal domain, this outcome is universally regarded as disastrous. So, of course, the United States Constitution currently requires the standard of proof for a criminal conviction to be beyond a reasonable doubt, whereas a mere preponderance of the evidence is usually all that's needed to impose civil liability. This crucial difference reflects the widely shared sentiment that it's a far greater injustice to convict the innocent than to acquit the guilty. And if criminal law skeptics had their way, how would our legal system be able to avoid this greater injustice? Would a single standard of proof be used for all legal disputes? If not, and a higher standard were used for some but not others, on what basis would this line be drawn in the absence of something approximating the criminal law as it presently exists? In short, both because of the desirability of public representation of criminal defendants and the need for a high standard of proof to convict the guilty, our criminal justice system exhibits its commitment to protect the innocent from hard treatment and condemnation. Although most criminal law skeptics trumpet their theories as pro-defendant, their reforms might make the foregoing commitments much more difficult to honor. Seven, proportionality. The severity of sanctions for criminal wrongs is governed by the principle of proportionality, a principle I regard as central to desert. I construe this principle as followed, as I construe this principle as follows. All, of the, all things being equal, the severity of the punishment that is deserved should be a function of the seriousness of the offense. Some commentators who may or may not regard themselves as criminal law skeptics have called for a sentencing scheme that dispenses with proportionality altogether. For two reasons, however, this response is hasty and ill-advised. First, no good theory of punishment and sentencing has emerged to take the place of a retributive theory in which proportionality plays a central role. Efforts to defend a wholly consequentialist theory or a non-consequentialist alternative that dispenses with proportionality and desert encounter devastating problems of their own. Risk-based sentencing, for example, has come under heavy fire. It is best not to abandon a principle with lots of intuitive support in the absence of a preferable option. 
Punishment and sentencing must proceed according to some set of normatively defensible considerations and no rival theory that awards a crucial role to proportionality and desert is on the horizon. Intuitions favoring proportionality are deeply ingrained and stubbornly persistent. To my mind, it's nearly unthinkable that punishment severity would be wholly decoupled from offense seriousness. The strong commitment to doing justice produces not just a demand for punishment, but also a judgment that sets its extent to the offender's blameworthiness. It is a truism that the sanctions imposed for non-criminal wrongs pay much less attention to the principle of proportionality. For example, a driver can incur tens of millions of dollars in damages and face economic ruin, absent insurance, by being only a tiny bit negligent if he crosses the median and happens to strike a bus full of professional athletes. Few would propose that the criminal response to this conduct should be comparable in severity to its civil counterpart. The reason for this disparity is simple. Criminal liability is governed by the norms of retributive justice, whereas civil liability is governed by those of corrective justice. And the logic of these two domains is entirely distinct. Theorists differ greatly in the details of how they explicate the principles of retributive and corrective justice. But in the criminal context, a response must respect the constraints of desert. So sanctions are inevitably governed by proportionality constraints. When the rationale is to compensate victims for harms actually caused, however, proportionality has no obvious application. Since the significance of proportionality is so different in each domain, a criminal law skeptic must be pressed to explain what role proportionality would play when the criminal law is fundamentally reconfigured. As before, I don't insist that this challenge is insurmountable. I only insist that it must be met. Eight, crimes as public wrongs. Some of the less familiar reservations about, the crimi about criminal law skepticism can be introduced by the thesis that whatever conduct is criminalized should amount to a public wrong. Criminal law is an instance of state authority and necessarily requires a political as well as a moral theory to rationalize it. Many legal philosophers who otherwise agree about very little find the idea of a public wrong to be unintelligible or otherwise unattractive. But there are many possible ways to explain the sense in which the state must have a substantial interest in prohibiting whatever wrongs are subjected to punishment. One strategy begins by trying to understand the objections that would become trenchant if the public dimension of criminal conduct were lost. Consider, for example, the recent outcry about the ongoing revelations of acts of sexual harassment by powerful men in sports, entertainment, and business. In many such cases, victims had accepted substantial amounts of monetary compensation from those who had harassed them. A defendant would be unlikely to pay this amount unless the settlement included a non-disclosure clause that precluded the victim from going public with her story. But many commentators criticize victims for not coming forward and thereby increasing the likelihood that perpetrators will reoffend. Reasonable minds disagree about what individual victims should do in the face of these criticisms. Should third parties be quick to fault them for accepting more money for their silence than they may earn in their lifetimes? Nonetheless, these critics have a point. Some states have recently enacted legislation that would void contractual clauses that prevent victims from telling their stories. And uh, other states, beside my own state of New Jersey, have uh, followed suit. I don't take a firm position on the wisdom of non-disclosure agreements for sexual harassment settlements, and no single example should distract us from the, the larger point. I mention this issue to illustrate one of the several matters at stake in deciding whether a given kind of wrong should be deemed as public or private. 
When a driver accidentally damages my car, almost no one has reservations about allowing me to accept monetary compensation for my loss and not to proceed further. If a voluntary agreement is reached between perpetrator and victim, the matter is presumably concluded. Is the foregoing example of sexual harassment comparable? In this case, it is hardly obvious that a non-disclosure agreement between victim and offender should be allowed to bring the matter to a close. When these agreements are enforced, any public interest in ongoing harassment remains unmet. Those who believe that perpetrators should not be permitted to buy silence have a powerful reason to classify the conduct on the public rather than on the private side of the divide. If skeptics succeed in calling the criminal law into question, it might be difficult to make sense of the foregoing considerations. What role would the public con uh, continue to play in a radically reconfigured system of criminal justice? Would all legal disputes be public or would none be? If a line between the public and the private would continue to be drawn, on what foundation would it rest? And would it not simply reintroduce the criminal category under a different guise? These questions pose further challenge, uh, challenges for criminal law skeptics. Nine, public demands for justice. Some movements to rethink the criminal category are driven by scholarly argument, but seldom informed by socio sociological reality. Despite a movement spearheaded by well-meaning progressive academics, I detect no groundswell of support among the general public to fundamentally revamp the criminal law as it currently exists. Even those laypersons who agree that the criminal justice system punishes too many persons with too much severity can be heard to complain when leniency is afforded to certain kinds of offenders. The best candidates to illustrate this phenomenon depend on one's political ideology. Among liberals, justice is said to be denied when police are not punished for using excessive force against unarmed minorities, when prosecutors are reluctant to indict white collar criminals, or when sexual offenders escape their just deserts. Among conservatives, justice is said to be denied when restrictions on abortion are relaxed or when illegal aliens are allowed to enter the country and avoid deportation. In these cases and others, the public demands justice, by which I gather they mean some form of accountability of wrongdoers that culminates in punishment. These demands are so strong that even the death of perpetrators does not silence them. For example, Jeffrey Epstein had been accused of abusing several underage women. When he committed suicide in his jail cell, before he could be tried, many of his victims expressed, quote, their jury, their fury at justice denied, unquote. These sociological facts are crucial and cannot be ignored by skeptical reformers. I am doubtful that alternative means to sanction wrongdoers and mollify victims would be adequate to satisfy those who call for justice. If the criminal law were fundamentally altered, all bets would be off as to how the public in general and victims in particular would respond. In view of the ubiquity of the foregoing demands, one can only wonder how citizens would react to a systematic call to dismantle the criminal justice system. Few criminal law skeptics purport to have any sociological evidence about how, how their ideas are likely to be received in a democratic state. Skeptics might reply that these calls for justice are barbaric residues of our darker emotions. But how can they be so sure? Paul Robinson cites a wealth of social science to show that the strong desire among laypersons, that strong wrongdoers be punished. He supports his conclusion through a wide variety of methods from representations of different disciplines, questionnaires to laypersons, behavioral economics studies, 
game theories, and cross-cultural investigations. Robinson concludes that the intuition to punish wrongdoers is a key part of what it means to be a member of the human species. And this intuition affects behavior. When injustice is regularly tolerated and injustice is unpunished, members are less likely to maintain allegiance to their group. The belief that the penal justice system is unwilling or unable to sanction wrongdoers is a central motivation for taking the law into one's own hands, a phenomenon on which I have already commented. In short, the public generally, and victims in particular, derive great satisfaction when they perceive that justice is done. When justice is denied, by contrast, they express frustration and disappointment. We should not be quick to condemn these widespread reactions as unenlightened. If doing justice is indeed essential for social cohesion, criminal law skeptics tamper with the penal law at their peril. Notice that my account thus far assigns a purely instrumental role to justice. It placates both victims and the public while removing the frustrations caused by injustice. In all likelihood, these effects produce a wealth of further goods, such as an increased willingness to cooperate and conform to law. In any event, I have not relied on a claim that often is singled out as the chief bone of contention between retributivists, such as myself, and their consequentialist adversaries. That adherence to a principle of retributive justice is an intrinsic good. In the present context, I have two reasons for not defending this claim. First, it is notoriously controversial, and I hope to rely on functions of criminal law that are not so hotly disputed. Secondly, if conformity with retributive justice is an intrinsic good, whatever goodness it achieves is probably minuscule. Remarkably, some retributivists identify the intrinsic good allegedly gained by conformity with retributive justice as the most important or even the only function of criminal law and punishment. In my judgment, this intrinsic good, if it exists at all, cannot be sufficiently weighty to offset the many negative effects of criminal justice emphasized by criminal law skeptics. But the instrumental good of justice is massive and should be enough to give skeptics pause. The public would not thank criminal law abolitionists for their efforts if many of these instrumental goods were sacrificed. 10 and finally, collateral consequences. Quite a few of the harms suffered by offenders take place after their official punishment has ended. The practices and policies I have in mind are generally called collateral consequences. Offenders bear not only the hardship and condemnation sentencing officials intend to inflict, but also a host of disadvantages resulting from decisions by other state actors as well as by private parties. Consider some of the most commonly imposed collateral consequences of crime in place today. Restrictions on employment constitute the most familiar type. The next most common category of collateral consequences pertain to housing. But law is not the only source of these collateral consequences. Some are informal, that is de facto, rather than formal, that is de jure. For example, 92% of private employers who replied to a survey say they require a background check for some or all jobs and admit to drawing a negative inference if the record of the applicant is not clean. Collateral consequences have a very bad reputation among many legal theorists. For a number of reasons, quite a few reformers who are appalled by the size and scale of the criminal justice system in the United States have called for an end to most or all of the collateral consequences I've mentioned. Criminal law skeptics are likely to regard it as an advantage of their reforms 
if collateral consequences could no longer be imposed. This position, like many of those held by skeptics, is motivated by humane concerns. Re-entry of prisoners into society is incredibly hard, and these difficulties need not be exacerbated by additional barriers. In his seminal book on criminal records, James Jacobs alleges that the need to balance the goal of preventing crime with the civil liberties of persons who interact with the criminal justice system is, quote, one of the greatest law enforcement challenges of our time, unquote. Some critics who believe that our society has failed this challenge have recommended the enactment of laws to outlaw some of the kinds of discrimination I've described, much as we ban discrimination on grounds of race or religion. Comparisons with racial discrimination are apt. Not surprisingly, these practices place an especially heavy burden on minorities, thereby raising protests from liberals and prioritarians alike. If the use of these collateral consequences is so, oftenly, is so often socially undesirable, how can they form the basis of a challenge to criminal skepticism? My answer is as follows. Despite the legitimate concerns of their opponents, it would be difficult to categorically reject the permissibility of each of the collateral consequences I've described. Reflection about the nature of our relationships with one another in our capacity as private agents helps to illustrate the problems we would face if collateral consequences were not used in our everyday lives. Inasmuch as three-year recidivism rates are as high as 68%, no one should be quick to fault persons for treating conviction as predictive of future problems. As John Monahan observes, it has long been axiomatic in the field of risk assessment that past crime is the best predictor of future crime. All, actuarially, all actuarial risk assessment instruments reflect this empirical truism. In light of these facts, are we really so certain that negative inferences should not be drawn? Job seekers with a spotless record might have a valid complaint against a government policy requiring private employers to treat a criminal record as irrelevant. Should state or private elementary schools be criticized for refusing to hire a teacher who had been convicted of child abuse? Would we be paranoid to discharge a housekeeper who had stolen from her private or from her former employer? It is rational to make these decisions on the basis of the best available evidence. Thus, the rationale that underlies the imposition of several collateral uh, consequences is difficult to discredit. For present purposes, the important point is that the foregoing measures are collateral consequences of crime. To what would these collateral consequences attach if not to crime, the category that skeptics propose to reconceptualize? If some modes of criminal law skepticism were implemented, public and private parties might be deprived of valuable information on which to make rational decisions in their economic and personal interactions. Alternatively, they might make decisions on the basis of more reliable information than a conviction. Even so, one might continue to challenge my supposition that some of the collateral consequences I've described are legitimate. If each of them is objectionable, they cannot form a sound basis to resist criminal law skepticism. I have no doubt that the use of collateral consequences could be greatly improved throughout the United States today. I maintain, however, that something significant would be lost if no collateral consequence could be imposed, an outcome that might follow from the adoption of some versions of criminal law skepticism. Okay, those are my 10 functions, and I now have a fairly short conclusion. What I've done is to describe a, a loosely knit trend I have called criminal law skepticism. <clears throat> I have not sought to reconstruct or respond to the arguments of these skeptics directly. Instead, my strategy is indirect. I describe the costs that are likely to be incurred by their revisionist views. <clears throat> I've identified 10 valuable functions 
performed by existing systems of criminal law. Functions that would be difficult or impossible to reproduce if skeptical ideas were put into practice. Each of these functions, I believe, contributes to a justification of the criminal law. The, thus, institutions of criminal law and punishment should not be thought to draw support from a single normative rationale. Here, as elsewhere in moral and legal philosophy, pluralism provides the better justificatory strategy. Can whatever the criminal law skeptic recommends as a substitute for existing systems of criminal justice perform some or all of the foregoing 10 functions? It's impossible to say. Perhaps some of the features I have listed could be replicated if states were to adopt a radically different system. I re-emphasize that different versions of skepticism have distinct features and implications and no single argument addresses them all. I've deliberately avoided an assessment of the details of any particular skeptical theory. Even if these details were examined, however, no serious evaluation could be undertaken without specifying what is proposed to replace existing systems of penal justice. As every philosopher knows full well, criticizing an idea is much easier than defending a better alternative. Here is where many skeptics fall short. Without a detailed account of what is alleged to be preferable to our current system of penal justice, an examination of a particular strain is necessarily incomplete. I've tried to describe what would make one alternative preferable to another. Skeptics of any stripe should be challenged to explain why the foregoing 10 functions are unimportant, could somehow be preserved by a replacement, or are less valuable than whatever advantages skeptics purport to secure. Thank you.